Sunday. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade. Early this morning, the Allies began the assault on the northwestern coast of Victor's European Force. Hello everyone, bonjour à tous, this is Clément Horvat for a new episode of Till Victory, a podcast about World War II and peace, this month with a very special guest. But before that, I gotta say a word about the book, because, well, it was supposed to be out by now, but we all know how unpredictable this year can be, don't we? Because of this COVID stuff, the release of uh, Till Victory, the Second World War by those who were there, was postponed by the publishers Pen and Sword Books and Casemate. And I have just found out about it. I'm so sorry about this, uh, but I have absolutely no control over that and I don't know much about what's happening. So... Apparently, the book is out in Europe at the end of next month and late December in America. Ah, uh, well, what's a few weeks after all those 15 years working on it and waiting for this English version to actually exist? Still, I feel very bad for all the families of the 50 different Allied soldiers honored in the book, and I cannot thank them enough for their patience. It will be out eventually very soon. So you can pre-order it online to be among the first to get a copy and it's all still very exciting. You know, I just remembered uh, a few days ago a conversation I had with my best friend's mother uh, many years ago when I started working on the book. She, she told me, why are you writing about the war? What, what do you know about it? You, you haven't lived through it. And, and I replied that I didn't write the book, that it was actually written by those young American, British or Canadian guys in their foxholes many decades ago, right in the midst of it. And all I do is gathering these stories and I carry the message. And it is important, otherwise they will just disappear and our new generations need to be reminded of how terrible war is so that we can appreciate peace and do our best to protect it. So, let's talk about my guests, because here's another message carrier. Um, my friend Florent Plana has been recording hundreds of veterans, and I'm very happy to have him on this podcast. He's about my age, I'm 32, and he's French as well. So, although we usually mostly talk about baguettes, beret, and the Eiffel Tower, this time we'll go deep, in English, into what it's like to talk to a World War II veteran. I've been doing this myself for most episodes of this podcast, but through him, it's like I talk to the whole greatest generation at once, you know. He'll share amazing stories, and he agreed to let me use some of his interviews that I've added here and there during the podcasts. Hello Flo, how are you buddy? Hello, Clément. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you, my friend? I'm doing pretty good today. <laughs> Very glad to have you on the show. Um, I, I really admire uh, your work with uh, World War II veterans, and uh, I'm glad you can talk about it on the show. Uh, can, can you can you tell us how many uh, veterans you you have interviewed over the years? It's uh, in the hundreds, right? Yeah. So uh, today, I know it's over 900. Uh, World War II wow. veterans, but I can't tell you the exact number because I lost track. Uh, every time I, I have a approximate number, you know, like last time there was 100, maybe mm -hmm. there was 98 or 103, but, uh, you know, 100. And so uh, I know it's over 900 now. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Uh, and you, you interviewed them all uh, on video, right? You traveled around the, the States. Can, can you tell us what was your work uh, so, over the years? Yeah, it's a long story, but uh, I'm going to try to make it short. Uh, yeah. So back in 2014, actually, I left France to go to the United States. You know, I finished my master's degree, uh, mm -hmm. history, tourism. And uh, I, I wanted to take a gap year. Uh, a lot of friends were doing that, uh, you know, after school, spend, mm -hmm. uh, spending a year like traveling, going around. And I, I wanted to take this opportunity to travel, but at the same time do something that I really wanted to do for many, many years is to, to meet and talk 
with, uh, you know, World War II veterans to mm -hmm. capture their stories, but as well to say, you know, thank you for um, what they did uh, during World War II to liberate France and Europe and other part of the world. So mm -hmm. back in 2014, I had like 3,000 euros and I went to the US and I bought a camper on Craigslist yeah. and I bought a camper for 1,900 euros. And uh, that was a 1988 Chevrolet, you know, yeah, uh, very old, very rusty, but uh, we made it. So we bought the, the camper and then uh, I hit the road. Um, it was normally just for a year. And actually I realized that there were so many veterans that never opened up, never talked about it, never been recorded that I felt yeah. guilty to come back home and just be like, you know, okay, it's done. I spent a good year and now. Nah. So after what I decided to come back six months, three months, five months, and every winter uh, I'm coming back to the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. now, now that I'm married, you know, as well with Jenny, she's from Bedford, Virginia. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more on the East Coast, and now Jenny and I sometimes uh, we're going together, recording veterans. She finds veterans as well. You know, she has contacts in yeah. Virginia, and uh, yeah, and you interview them uh, on 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 tape on video. Um, how do they feel about sharing things on video like this? Is it is it easy to to have them you know uh, open up and talk about their experiences? So it depends. Uh, I've been very fortunate in many cases where uh, the veterans agreed to talk with me because the family kind of prepared them that mm -hmm. a French was coming. He wanted to ask mm -hmm. some question, and I think that some of them uh, before you know, agreeing to be interviewed, they felt a little bit curious. Who is yeah. that guy who is 20, 23 years old coming to the place, to my place with his camper to ask me some questions? So I think they wanted to meet me before, you know, it was not just like being interviewed. I was like, oh, who is that guy? He's from France. I was in France 70 years ago. And mm -hmm. why is he coming here? And so most of the time when I was coming to their place, they were asking some question. First of all, who are you? Why do you do that? And I was telling the story of my family, you know, during the occupation, four years during the German occupation, my grandpa was, um, you know, in a Germany, in a kind of a camp, you know, working mm -hmm, camp mm -hmm. and all the story. And they were like, wow, wow. And, I, you know, they were fascinated about the story of my family. And I was like, wow, I mean, I've got so many questions that, I mean, I'm going to be 10 times more fascinated by your story, but... You know, I, I feel like surprised that mm. they wanted to know more about my story. And afterward, you know, because I was opening up a little bit, some of them started to, well, oh, I was in your country. I was there and I was there and I knew exactly which city they were talking about. Mm. And sometimes, you know, I could see on the wall, you know, like uh, a frame with an insignia, some award. And I would be like, oh, so you were in the 9th Infantry Division and, oh, you, you, you were wounded. I see a purple heart. And mm -hmm. they could see that I, I understood. Yeah, their so you, that's how you, you earn their trust. Yes. It's, yeah. They realized that I could speak the same language, that I yeah. knew about the places that they liberated, that they went through. And I don't know, if you know, like, for example, uh, the city of Metz, you know, the 95 Infantry Division mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. talk about in, in, in your book, uh, Eastern France, yeah. Yeah, Eastern part of France. How many Americans who have never been in France, never been in combat, especially, you know, in 1944, I've heard about the city of Metz. So mm. if if I know about the city, maybe going to be willing to share some stories about the liberation of the town because I know exactly where it is. I've been there. Uh, you know, it's it's just a connection. Yeah, but but uh, it's the same uh, problem for like most civilians. Actually, they they have trouble, uh, uh, you know, sharing all those war experiences with civilians because they think that uh, nobody would understand. I guess it must be uh, even harder when you're young, like a young Frenchman coming to their home. Uh, so you used your uh, your family's history to. Uh, uh, explain them why you are interested in World War Two. Was it the first motivation behind your work? Um, I would say that it's you know I, I've been like like you, very interested by this part of history for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. um, 
my my family is from Normandy, so I visited the Normandy American Cemetery when I was very young. I visited Aromanche and all those famous, you know, places. And mm -hmm. uh, I've been always interested by this part of history. And since I discovered more stuff from my family, you know, like about my grandpa in Germany, my great grandpa that fought in the French underground for about a year. Mm -hmm. uh, since I discovered those stories, you know, I wanted to know more about it, more about the liberation of Normandy, more about the liberation of their town, more about the liberation of France. And, and who were those guys? What did they went through? What happened mm -hmm. to them? It, it's very complex because I think something that I, I've been always interested in. I, mm -hmm. I've, I've met a, the first veteran that I remember that was in 2005. I was 15. Mm -hmm. And I was in Illinois. My sister was an exchange student. And I, I, I've met a Pearl Harbor veteran. And he's still alive today. He's mm -hmm. a 99 or 100. But that was the first veteran I've met. And I don't know. That was so... I, I was kind of... I was meeting a movie star. Yeah. You know, everybody was around me. Like, oh, sir, can I check your hand? Can you tell me a story? And I'm like, oh, wow, all over the place. I could not understand anything. My sister was translating. And I was like, oh, wow, wow, wow. So I've been always excited by that idea of listening stories, you know, mm. and and capturing them and sharing them with other people. It's even better. So yeah. I don't know. It's it's. I know I'm I'm very vague in my answer, <laughs> but I think the story of my family pushed me to learn more about this period of time, wh yeah. and what people really went through. You know, civilians and soldiers. And how come um, those men and women never shared their stories before? Surely their families must be interested in their own uh, family's history. Uh, how come they never talked about it? Uh, so that's a tricky, complex question. Yeah. Uh, because every family is different. I've seen some families who are so, so dedicated um, they've been always interested by the story of their family, even if their father or grandfather, if if he was not talking, they were doing research on the side. They were trying to learn more about the unit of mm -hmm. you know their relatives. Sometimes they even traveled to the place yeah. uh, where those veterans fought, uh, even if the veterans never came back. Example: mm -hmm. Last year, I had a tour with a family of a 1st Infantry Division veteran, 18th Infantry Regiment, Omaha Beach D-Day veteran. He's still mm -hmm. alive. Uh, he's doing pretty good, but he never returned to Normandy. He doesn't want to. And he yeah. never really opened up to his family about it. And they thought, we're going to go back, you know, where you were in 1944, and maybe, you know, you would up, you're going to open up about your story. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, I brought them, you know, on Omaha Beach, uh, where the 18th Infantry Regiment landed, and we went a little bit inland to see a couple places. And uh, they were hoping that this trip would help their father and grandfather, you know, to to talk about the war. Did it? I think it started to open up because uh, about three months ago, I received a message from the family, and they said that I could now ask him some question. Okay. So I tried to call him, but... For the moment, it didn't work, and especially with the COVID and stuff, it's tricky, you know, because sometimes yeah. they need family or people with them when I'm calling because they're hard of hearing. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to talk with him very soon. So about the family, we have those family who have a big, big interest, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have absolutely no interest at all. Uh, I remember one veteran that I've met back in 2017, uh he showed me all his pictures, memorabilia and stuff. And now I regret it, you know, because I, of, I always felt guilty. I, I, I never wanted people to think that I was meeting veterans to get their stuff, you know, like yeah. uniform and stuff. But he actually showed me all his pictures and, you know, memorabilia. And he said, you need to take it because my family will not keep that. And I'm going to be dead soon. So, you know, he was like, just take it. And yeah. I I only took one picture of him uh, of him his portrait, yeah. But, and I told him I I I can't. I'm like I feel bad. I need to talk with your family first. And he was like they don't care. You don't understand. You know. So 
I, I would say that every family is different. You've got some people who are very supportive. They're trying to help their father or grandfather to talk about it, but nicely and just to make them feel better. And some just don't care. So, yeah, it's the same on my, you know, with the uh, all the letters that show up on eBay and everything. Like mm -hmm. you, you can clearly see that a lot of uh, families don't really they are not really interested in their own uh, history and it's a bit sad but um what what is your favorite interview do you have a favorite one that's a tricky question again um because every interview are exceptional you mm -hmm. know when you have someone who is sharing with you some stories that he never mentioned to his own family to his friends it's always exceptional it's like a gift mm. But, you know, some of the veterans, sometimes their memory is not very clear. Uh, some of them, you know, are, um, unfortunately, it's too late, you know, mm, to record mm. their story. But it's always such a privilege, an honor to talk with them just to say thank you and shake their hand. So I would say that every interview is 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 great, amazing. And But, of course, Clément, some of those interviews have touched me a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've got a few examples. Uh, w one of them uh, was Barney Hovey. Uh, he was a replacement and he arrived in Normandy to be assigned to the 83rd Infantry Division mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just after Saint-Ny fell uh, in the mid-July of 1944. The 83rd lost a lot of men, you know, in Normandy. Uh, within three mm -hmm. weeks, you know, a lot of men were actually casualties, killed, wounded mm -hmm. or missing in action. And uh, Barney Hovey and uh, one of his friends, actually, they were both replacements. So, which is kind of funny, is that they were both from Boston, Massachusetts. They trained in a replacement center, you know, together. And uh, after the Battle of St. Nice, they were both assigned to the 83rd Division, but mm -hmm. in a different company, same regiment, but different company. And um, it was very moving because uh, Barney Hovey talked a lot about uh, Walter Garside, you know, that, that friend that he... You know, from the replacement. Yeah. And um, uh, Walter was killed just within, a, I, I think it's 48 hours, 72 hours. He was killed in action by um, a shell in his foxhole. And Barney Hovey didn't know about it. And he was trying to know. He was writing to the family of Walter Garside. He was writing to his family. I mean, he, was, he didn't know what happened. And it's finally uh, six months after during the Battle of the Bulge that uh, he was able to actually go uh, to the place where the company of Walter Garside was located and he was trying to find him, you know, and he was asking all the time, you know, same question. Have you seen Walter, Walter Garside, you know, blah, blah, blah. And nobody could answer him. Nobody knew about him. Mm -hmm. And actually, one at one point, some, some guy going to remember who he's talking about. And he, he, he just told him, you know, he was killed shortly after he was he arrived in the company. And for Bonnie, that was such a shock because he had no clue that his buddy, one of his best friends, actually has been killed mm -hmm. six months earlier. And when I've met Bonnie, that's the, the story that is very moving for me. When I've met Bo Bonnie, I asked him, do you know where he's buried? And he had no clue. He had no clue where his buddy was buried because, you know, today we have uh, internet, find a grave and all those, you know, uh, tools, wonderful yeah. tools. Mm -hmm. And I told him he's buried in Normandy. And he was like, whoa, you know, he, he was just, he didn't know. And so I actually, a couple months after I came back to, to France, I took my car and I drove to the Normandy American Cemetery and I took a picture of the grave with the picture of Bonnie and Walter side mm -hmm. by side. And I sent it to the family and this showed the picture to Bonnie. That was the se first time in 71 years that he could see the grave of his buddy. Mm. And it's just one story, Clément, you know, there's many, many like that, but... For me, I was just so moved that I was able to kind of bring some relief to this old World War II veteran who had no clue where his best buddy was buried. And uh, since, you know, we kept in touch with Barney Harvey family, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they sent me some letters that he sent back home talking about Walter, you know, how uh, thankful he was to have such a good buddy in the army that they would, you know stay side by side and protect each other. 
But, you know, can you imagine that feeling when he he actually realized that they would both be attached to the 83rd, but different company? Yeah. So they could not protect each other. And as replacements, when you arrive in the outfit that has been in combat, who going to be your fox or buddy? Who is the guy that you, you know, you have kind of this... Uh, connection with that you develop sometimes during the training and that after what in combat you like protecting each other so that's probably why walter garside was killed and that's probably why nobody remembered him Mm. it's because he was a fresh replacement he had no experience in combat and was killed like just you know a few days after he was assigned to the 83rd so that's one of the story and i've got thousand and thousand like that you know but yeah (laughs) Courtesy of Florent Plana, this is Jack Friedman of the 8th Infantry Division talking about his first day of combat. We went to a replacement depot uh, up near Liège, Belgium. And uh, they loaded me up into a truck and we kept going toward the front line. And pretty soon, this was at night, I would see a flash of light on the horizon, and I could hear boom, boom, boom. And as we got closer, uh, the, the boom, boom, booms got louder, the flashes got brighter, and then, that's the first time I really realized that, hey, boy, this is a war, there's a war going on, and those are guns, and those are shells, and you're going toward that. And I say that was the first time I really realized and thought about it that this is this is not funny. It's not practice anymore. This is the real thing. They dumped some more of the guys out of the truck, and and a jeep then picked me up and two other guys, and we drove and drove and drove and then they had to turn the lights out because of you know didn't want to get me spotted, and we reached the a little wooded area, and the fellow on the jeep said, this is the end of the jeep ride. We're going to walk from here on. And then we could really hear the the, the artillery going back and forth. And he he led me down a little path through some trees, and he dropped off these other two guys, and I'm the last one. And he said, follow me. We've got a little ways to go yet. So I walked and walked and walked, and we got to a place, and he said, Here's a hole. I want you to get in that hole tonight, and I'll be back in the morning and talk to you, and we'll get things going. So I spent the night, and I heard every little crack in the trees and the leaves, and uh, and I, I'm just visualizing or picturing in my mind that there's a bunch of Germans down there with guns and. I made it through the night. I'm in my hole. The daylight starts, and here comes these guys behind me. And one of them got hit, and he fell, kind of fell into my hole. And I was in there trying to dress that. He got the hunk of the side of his back hit, and I was trying to stop the bleeding and not, and being just a raw rookie and, and that had been there one night and uh, doing my best to, to get the blood stopped. And he said he wanted, wanted a cigarette. And so I lit him up a cigarette. And the smell of that blood and that smoke put off a, an odor that every once in a while I'll smell. And it, it'll take me right back to that, to that moment in that hole. And anyway, we got we got him, got the medics come get him, and uh, and then the sergeant, the squad leader, came in and introduced himself to me and and chit chatted and said, "This it's not a picnic up here. You it's gonna be tough, but uh, we're gonna make it." Um, because of you know the the subject being a bit touchy or did you have bad experiences uh, while interviewing uh, World War II uh, veterans? It, it's very rare. Um, I would say that today, the the one that I'm recording, some of them, and I remember one time a veteran told me that 
I think it's CEO Boer from the 95 Infantry Division, but I don't remember if it's him or not. But that's recently someone told me, Flo, the stories that I'm telling you, it's like it's the story of someone else. Mm. Uh, it's been such a long time that the pain, the sorrow, uh, the stress is gone for some of them. Mm. So it was not difficult for them to talk with me about that. But maybe 20 years ago, that would have been a different story. Yeah. But what I'm telling you, it's not for all veterans because I've met a medic of the third division uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio, who is actually still suffering PTSD. Okay. So, you know, it's very different. And in some case, the veterans are willing to talk about it and you can feel that as if they've been already interviewed, they already talked about it. So mm. uh, it's kind of, kind of a speech, you know, and they're sometimes detached from the story, which means that there's not a lot of emotion. Uh, it's very different. But some of the guys that are recorded, because it would be the first time they talked about it, it was very moving. And even for me, I don't know how to say that, but the chemistry, I was moved. I was in joy because sometimes they were like, sharing some stories that they never talked about, like sometimes with ladies or, you know, alcohol. Mm. And I, it was so funny. I was laughing so hard, you know. And sometimes it was so sad, so deep that I was in pain with them. I mean, mm. I felt very bad, you know. So I don't remember what was your question, but... <laughs> <laughs> if, if one of the interview went wrong like you told me actually about one that uh that went very wrong yeah uh so it, it's not that it, it went wrong but it went differently than i was expecting uh, expected and i was like at that time that was back in 2015 i was mm -hmm. only 24 so we're in Florida. We're with my buddy Hugo Le Gourierec. he came with me for about a month and it's one of my best buddies so Mm -hmm. We had a good time together, but as well, he's working in the movie industry. So he was filming kind of a road trip okay. adventure and he's planning to do a documentary. But anyway, one time we visited three brothers. They're from New Jersey, if I remember correctly, but during the winter, they're going in Florida, they have a camper and stuff. And so I met them, a new new new. Uh, Newspaper reporter was there, so everything went fine. Uh, we were all around the table. We, we were having a drink. They were telling a little bit about their story. One was in the Air Corps. One was with the 91st Infantry Division in Italy, and the other one was in the U.S. Merchant Marine. Mm -hmm. They started to tell their story, basic stuff. I served in Italy. I was wounded three times, blah, 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 blah. Okay, no question. The news, news reporter, reporter, take his picture. Oh, that was an amazing meeting. And so I asked them, you know, I would like to come back to conduct a, a, just an interview with you, one mm -hmm. with you and one with you. So three brothers, but three different interviews. Mm -hmm. So the brother was in the Martian Marine. He was not suffering any type of PTSD. He was not like, he was okay. So he said, yeah, sure, come back. You know, it's going to be fun. Came back two days later. All around the table, such a weird situation. I came back and they were like, what do you want to know exactly? And the guy from the Air Corps said, the only thing I did, I bombed people. I dropped bomb on people, civilians that get killed. That That's what you want to know? I killed your people. And he started to be very aggressive. And the other, the merchant marine veteran was like, calm down, calm down. It's going to be okay. And the veteran of the 91st Division and it's the first time I kind of give those details, Clement. Yeah, I told mm -hmm. you the story, but not with all the details because, you know, even I was in shock a little bit. And the other brother was, was with the 91st Division, was like, what do you know about the war? What do you know? You mm -hmm. don't know how it smells. You have no idea. And, um, and the young brother, again, was in the Merchant Marine, was like, no, don't be so rude to him. Don't be so mean. He probably know a little bit about the war. He's met so many guys. And the other brother was like, he has no clue. He don't know. So just no. And so I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, I'm going to leave. I, I, I don't want to bother you. I'm so sorry. And so the young brother who was in the Merchant Marine came back to the camper with me, you know, my camper. Mm. He was like, Flo, I'm very sorry. 
but my brother, you know, was in the 91st division. He has been in trouble every night. Like, he has nightmares since he arrived two days ago. He doesn't sleep. You think about the war, it's too much. Mm. He, he, he's got bad PTSD, and... And it's coming back right now. He has bad nightmares, so we need to avoid the subject. It's better if you leave and blah, blah. And I was so sorry, you know, very, Clément, I was so sorry, ashamed for what I did of bothering them. And I didn't know that some veterans, even 70 years after, it was so painful because the guy who was in the 91st division so you probably know that division because you're doing a lot of research and not only about one or two units. Yeah, they um, were in Italy. They were in Italy, saw a lot of combat. He was in the infantry. He was mm-hmm. wounded three times, three purple hearts. He was deaf. He couldn't hear anything. And his brother told me he saw so much combat that it's not because he's old. He's been deaf since 1945. And I was like, okay, you know, he was firing probably his M1 rifle mm. many, many times and that was one of the occasions where I felt bad. Was they were misunderstanding. They were a uh, lot of pain, a lot of uh, not violence. It was not violence, but a lot of yeah, under misunderstanding and yeah, just pain. A lot of pain for those guys. Yeah, that's what I said earlier about uh, veterans uh, knowing that us civilians would never understand what they went through. Um, but but still, we 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 would like to to know a, a little bit about what it was like, so that we understand the the importance of their sacrifice and what they did for 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 our freedom. Yeah. Um. So did did you change the way you interview veterans after that experience, or? No, I did not. Um, no, 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 I did not. The thing is that um, I think there are many many veterans in that were like kind of in the same who has the same profile profiles they don't want to talk about it mm-hmm. but it's 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 kind of i don't want to say anything bad but the family pushed me mm-hmm. to talk with those three brothers yeah oh my family it's an amazing story three brother in war blah 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 blah, blah. yeah so that's why the first time when we went there was the newspaper article uh, reporter sorry it went well because we didn't talk much that's a cool story. It's about oh, they're so brave. It's uh, uh, it's they're heroes and stuff. So it's a cool picture, you know. It's a cool article. But yeah. when you try to go deeper, yeah. it's a lot of pain, a lot yeah. of you know sorrow. So I would say now, if some of the like maybe something that I changed, and uh, sometimes the family contact me, and I'm like asking them. Is he okay with the idea of talking about the war? Yeah. Is that something that he's comfortable with? Or if he's not comfortable, but is that something that he really wants to? Because I don't want the family to force their relatives to talk about it. And I'm not judging them because it's understandable. You know, they want to know what daddy, you know, did during the war. Yeah, what and they actually cared. They wanted it to be uh, recorded for uh, exactly. Forever, but sometimes yeah. it's hard. Yeah, of course. Uh, and some family are, are very good because sometimes they realize, okay, daddy never talked about it. So if the Frenchie is coming, let the Frenchie talk to him, but we will not be in the room. We're going to even maybe leave the house for a few hours. Mm. And like just example, back in 2015, January 2015, I've met a wonderful man by the name of Waldo Werft. Mm-hmm. He was a medic, 16th Infantry Regiment, 1st Division. Yeah. He opened up just a few months before and actually did one short interview for a local uh, newspaper. And when I went there, the family actually left. Mm-hmm. So actually, I recorded Waldo for about four hours. Four hours of audio video recording. That was the first time that he was ever talking about most of those stories. But I gave the interview to the family mm-hmm. so they can know, they can hear, but Waldo was not, was not, you know, didn't have to tell those stories directly to the family, you know? Yeah. And, and do you think time has uh, an effect on their memory uh, as well? Um, of course, yeah. In what way? So many way. 
uh, so let's be honest. Out of 100 interviews, uh, maybe 10, 15 going to be from the beginning to the end, very clear, uh, very understandable and very accurate. Mm -hmm. I would say very compared to the others because of course it's been 75, 76 years. So you're losing memory. Of course, some of the veterans I've met, you know, they have dementia and some of them have, have, have trouble to remember, yeah. but as well, because the time has affected sometimes their memory, their uh -huh. perception of what they did, of where they were from maybe books they've read, from movies they've watched, and sometimes from reunions mm -hmm. that they've been and some the stories they heard. And it's normal because, and I'm not trying to judge, I'm just saying it's absolutely normal that after so many years, you think sometimes that your story is the one that you've read in a book or watching a movie or you know that you heard from a buddy of yours that yeah. was there. You yeah. were probably maybe not there, but because your buddy told that story so many times, you think you were there. It's almost yeah. like yeah, you, you lived it, yeah. Yeah, but some case, and my favorite meetings were with the ones who were from total unknown units who were not like um, in big Hollywood movies, were yeah. not really covered by any historians. And you have sometimes in those cases some excellent interviews because you know that there were nothing to say. They were not in St. Mary Glees and they saw John Steele on the church, mm -hmm. you know, they were not on Omaha Beach with the first wave. They were not, you know, they were units like that arrived a few months after D-Day or other units that fought in other campaigns. Some of those guys never been to any reunions and they started to open up just a few months, a few years ago. And if their memory are great, you can have an amazing, amazing interview. It makes me think about um, George Klein, you know, um, some units uh, get more recognition than yep. uh, others and it, and it leads uh, also to sad things like veterans lying about their service. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I remember when I listened to George Klein uh, of the Second Rangers uh, talking yep. about his D-Day on Point du Hoc, mm -hmm. uh, when in fact he actually never went there. Um, the poor man lied about it and he received a lot of flack for it, but he yeah. was, he was actually a veteran and he was uh, even wounded in Eastern France, uh, serving with the uh, 5th Infantry Division. Um, yeah. But mm -hmm. aren't we actually responsible for this? I mean, uh, all we see during the ceremonies are reenactors playing paratroopers or elite rangers um, that were in this or that Hollywood movie. Um, what do the uh, Navy, Air Force, logistics, or even regular yeah. GI veterans think about this? Do, do they actually feel forgotten? Yeah, I mean, your point is so interesting. And I think that we're going to start to touch some very uh, sensible subject, but very interesting. So, George Klein, I, I, I've met this man. He's, he's very nice, wonderful yeah. meeting uh, at his place. But let me tell you one thing. When I've recorded him, so he was telling me the story of Point du Hoc, the second Ranger Battalion and stuff. And after he talked about Point du Hoc, he was like, that's my story. Mm. And I was like, what? But I was like, what happened after Point du Hoc? And so he, he lied, of course, about it. But he told me that, you know, he was wounded at Point du Hoc. And later on, he was assigned to the 5th Infantry Division as, a, I think it was a, in the artillery unit. You know, he was a lieutenant. Yeah. I yeah. think it was a forward observer, if I'm correct. But... Uh, you know, it's been a long time, five years now. And actually, we spent more time uh, talking about his time with the 5 Infantry Division that, you know, with the Rangers. Yeah. So, my point is that I'm from France, I'm recording him, and he thought that the only thing I wanted to hear about was Pont du Hoc. On D-Day, yeah. On D-Day. So, that's, yes. Okay, I'm not trying to, but it's 50-50. Of course, you don't have to lie about your service. You can be proud of it. It's it's easy to say, okay, when nobody cares. Uh, I, and on the other end, I'm like, is that our fault? I think yes and no. Yes, probably, because if you're like going to a place, a, a veteran meeting, and you have side by side 
a second ranger lieutenant that climbed the cliff of Pondio Condide, and next to him you have a forward observer of the 5 Infantry Division that landed a month after D-Day mm. and participated in battles that you never heard about, like Hill 183, Vidouville, they were in Angers, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Okay, so who the kid or who the historians, the guy who love history, going to go? Mm, mm. He's gonna check the hand of the guy who was at Pont York because he heard about it. He saw was uh, saving Private Ryan, the longest day, you know. Like the band of brothers, everybody, like the last 20 years, wanted to meet and talk with Easy Company, 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, 101 Airborne Division veterans. Yeah. And it's great. They did an amazing job. I mean, I'm so thankful for those guys and some of my best buddies uh, over there. Uh, are part of this group, uh, Gil Gilbertson, uh, Columbus, Ohio, I Company 506 Pershing Infantry Regiment. I visited him four, five, six times. I'm in touch with his family. It's a close relationship, you know, and I've got a lot of respect for those paratroopers. But we wasted so much time the last 20 years focusing on those units that we completely put on the side all their outfit mm. because they were no airborne, they were no D-Day. Like, I'm just thinking, how many men of the 44 Infantry Division has been recorded? How many books going to be published about the 104 Infantry Division or 103rd Cactus Division? Mm. Of course, they arrived late. They were not on D-Day. Uh, they were not in. They were not in Normandy. But if you were in those units, don't, don't you think it could be very frustrated to go, for example, to a meeting? where there's other veterans and everybody is just like shaking heads of the same guys, signing autograph. And because you were on the wrong unit, wrong, you know, with a game as we say. Yeah, yeah. You saw the same combat. You see your friends being killed. You spent sometimes more days actually sleeping in foxholes and being under fire at those famous unit. Yeah. And people they don't even come to check your hand. It's not only about units, it's also nations and campaigns. Uh, like, yeah. I mean, in, until victory, I tried to cover the whole campaign in Europe, uh, even though most people, I believe, I actually only care about D-Day. And, and you, um, you also interviewed many men who fought in Italy, Africa, Germany, uh, Northern Europe. Do, do they... Do you think they actually get less recognition or is it just because we're French and most of us believe that the war started in Normandy and ended with the liberation of Paris? So good point on one thing. Yes, we're French, so we're going to know more about uh, the units that liberated France. But uh, some of those units that liberated France and so heavy combat, not necessarily like during Operation Dragoon, but going up, you know, toward the Vosges, um, you know, I'm thinking about the 45th Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. um, they saw heavy, heavy combat uh, in Italy. You know, they landed in southern France, Operation Dragoon, August 15, 1944, and went north, you know, and saw heavy combat, you know, in the eastern part of France. Mm. And uh, what about those guys? They were in France. Yeah. They saw many, many days, many months of combat. Like, uh, look at the 45th Infantry Division. They were even in Germany, liberated Dachau, you know, yeah, yeah. in April 45. I think it's the, probably like uh, the, the, the movie, you know, industry, the, the Hollywood movies, the, the books. And um, I don't know. I think D-Day has been always like something that fascinated people. But uh, yeah, I, I feel sorry. And I've met some guys on Italy where, uh, if I tell you that, it's not just my feeling. I've met some guys who were in the in the 36th, 45th, mm -hmm. 3rd Division. And afterward, if you talk about the Italian campaign, you know, the 91st, the 88th, and other units, they feel that they have been forgotten. Yeah. Some of the guys that I've met really feel that... Even at the time, uh, they, they were they were fighting the, the Forgotten War. Yeah. They were the D-Day Dodgers. D-Day Dodger, yeah. 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 And, you know, it's, uh, it's you, me, and other people collecting those stories that can make a little bit of difference. Mm. Um, I've got one of my friends, his name, his name is Maxime Rivière, yeah, and know you know him pretty he's well. In the, he's in the second <laughs> book, the Until Weeks yeah. book. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, Maxime Rivière. And uh, he's spending his entire free time researching the 8th Infantry Division. So, mm. you know, they landed on July the 4th, 
1944 on Utah Beach is so heavy combat in Normandy, uh, in Brittany, and afterward, you know, in the Yorkton Forest, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But honestly, you would never see any reenactors. You would never see anyone doing any research or wearing the 8th Infantry Division patch uh, in Normandy. Mm -hmm. Since he has his Facebook page, Instagram page, and he's doing a lot of work on the 8th Infantry Division, now you start to see some reenactors representing this unit and maybe more people are going to start to do research maybe more people are going to start to i don't know uh more events at the 8th infantry division and i think honestly that it's starting from one guy just showing to the world that yeah the 8th infantry division fought in normandy yeah uh they were as well in Brittany and other part of france and europe and they lost 12,000 men yeah mm. but who knew about it And I think that your work, my work, and the work of Maximilian, other guys like that, going to help to maybe highlight the stories of unknown units, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. unknown campaign, as you said. And what about those other campaigns? Do, do you have examples of uh, extraordinary stories from Italy, North Africa, or other less known theaters of operations? Oh, I've got uh, tons of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of them, you know, uh, I'll... Uh, DeFazio was with the 36th Division and he was badly wounded uh, during the Rapido, uh, you know. Yeah, a terrible battle. Yeah. yeah. Cross River and uh, he, he saw a near lot Monte of combat. Near Monte Cassino. Mm. Yeah, near Monte Cassino, exactly. And uh, uh, it, it was still, you know, very difficult to, for him to talk about it. And uh, he lost to quite a lot of guys there. And uh, I think that even today, like the, during the interview, you can feel that it, uh, it's painful to talk about it. An amazing mm. man, a gentleman, you know, very, very nice. His family is so nice. But um, they saw terrible, terrible combats. And uh, it, the Italian campaign was just very brutal. When you think about it, it's, it, it took you know, over a year, you know, from Sicily, July 1943 to the end of the war. And they were still in the northern part of Italy fighting, you know, in the mountains and yeah. bloody battle. Courtesy of Florent Plana, this is Albert DiFazio of the 36th Infantry Division talking about the Rapido River battle. That's when it, the shell hit behind me, it blew me into a ditch. I was out of it only for seconds and then I woke up and uh, I felt pain behind me and looked behind. My shirt was tarred, tattered. My pants had started and I put my hand back in. I went into a hole. I was bleeding. Same thing in my back. My shirt was gone. My bipack was out. I put my hand there. And the same thing. My finger went in. I was bleeding. And I heard the lieutenant. I looked over at my buddy. Oh, my God. His whole back was gone. He was dead. You could tell. He died. Oh, God. So the lieutenant hauled it back and he says, uh, fuck you. He said, you guys all right? I said, well, Lieutenant, I'm hitting four places. I said, but my buddy's gone because he was shattered. He said, well, go back across the river and get some help. I said, yeah, how in the hell am I going to get back there? Because everything was coming in. Mortars, artilleries, and small gunfire. It's a wonder I didn't step on a mine. They had to have a mine out there. So I started back. Got up, was hoppling across, and made it back. It went in 10 feet of the river. And uh, on my left, the shell hit. I was heading back toward the river, hobbling across the way best I could. And I got within 10 feet of the river, and uh, a shell hit to my left. And it hit, hit one of the guys there, you know. So instead of me going get across the river and go get some help, I went to him. And I looked down, and who do you think it was? They called him Spike. It was Lieutenant Spike. He was hit bad. He was out of it. And nobody around. Everybody was by flying. We got to the river. Was going back up to the mountain. <laughs> so I happened to look around, and I seen a couple guys, and I hollered at him. I said, hey, come here. This is Lieutenant Spike. He's hit bad. He's out of it. We got to get him out of here. He's going to die here. So we picked him up, dragged him down to the river, go put him in the rubber pontoon boat and shimmered across and I cut the lines. They had handles on each side, but they had the rope on them to keep them from floating away. 
We put them in there and carried them down along the river. I didn't know where we were going, but I happened to run into some guys. <laughs> and I told them, I said, hey, do you guys happen to know where the, where the hospital is? Yeah, go straight down a certain point, turn left, you'll see the lights. So that's what we did. And when we went there, oh my God, there was bodies laying all over the place. And I called the, the fellow over, I said, the lieutenant said, Pat, he's out of it. He needs to get and looked at him. He said, we're busier than heck inside. The doctors and nurses are working feverishly. <clears throat> he said, well, look, he's all, oh, we'll take him right now. He said, how about you guys? I said, well, I'm hitting two places. He said, but will you be all right? I said, oh, yeah, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. So he said, I'll be back to get you. So when he took the lieutenant in, it wasn't minutes. He come back, picked me up on the stretch. It took me in, and they worked on me, take my shrapnel out. And then that's when I woke up in the hospital in, in Naples. Now let's compare our results because uh, although I haven't interviewed as many veterans as you did, obviously, um, I got some pretty striking stuff said in the previous episodes of the podcast and I, I wanted to have your opinion on them. Um, in, uh, in episode two, uh, Tom Rice uh, said that um, he wasn't scared at the time of D-Day that, uh, I, and I quote, he had more end grenades than we had Germans. Um, well, Tom is a badass for sure, <laughs> you yeah, know. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure most veterans didn't feel the same way, right? Yeah. To do, be do they talk about being scared uh, yeah. in combat? So that's the thing that I think through the years, uh, their own feelings can be not always accurate mm -hmm. because uh, sometimes I try to place myself, you know, in their shoes. And uh, I'm sure, you know, the, the beginning of the war, when they first joined the army for the first time, they were out of the States for, you know, for training in South part of the US or, you know, other areas they never been. I'm sure there were a lot of excitement. Mm -hmm. It was kind of felt as an adventure, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure that after months and months, even years of training, they were like, so when do we go? When do we going to kick the, the butt of the Germans? You know, they were like pro probably very exciting, very enthusiastic, you know, like, yeah, we're going to do the job. We're going to finish the war before Christmas or, you know, some things like that. But um, some of the veterans that I've met told me about that stage of excitement. And after what, you know, when they left the United States to cross the Atlantic, when they mm -hmm. went to England and some of them, you know, uh, started to realize that, oh, the war is actually real. I'm going to yeah. be sent to war. And I think every veteran, you know, has a different, like, stage when they you realize that, that maybe you're going to, you know, go in combat and not return, even if they're kind of hoping that everything's going to be fine. Maybe some guy around them going to be killed, but not themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. But a um, lot of veterans I've met told me they were scared to death. Like, yeah. they were scared. They were excited, of course, to go in combat, see if they've been prepared for that for many, many months. And I think the airborne guys, you know, they had a different type of mentality. Maybe I'm wrong, but some of them were, like, really, like, Tom Rice that I've met, like, you know, badass, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you can feel that those guys uh, were tough guys, you know, tough fighters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But imagine... In most of the case, you know, in, in Europe, uh, after being in combat for so many months or years, a lot of guys were actually in combat were replacements. Yeah. You know, they didn't go in combat with a group of men that they trained with. They were not that, oh, yeah, we're going to kick, the, you know, we're going to kill Hitler and take his mustache. I'm sure a lot of guys that were replacement were just like, they didn't know where they were going. Yeah. They were like, who are those guys around me? There were probably a lot of fear. I think so. I know it's a very long answer, but... Yeah, um, I, I mean, it's a bit more like what Cecil Newton said in episode four, uh, uh, who said that the Germans were trained, schooled, they were soldiers, and Cecil said, uh, we were civilians. Uh, like Many felt like they were just civilians in uniform and just wanted to go home. Um, yeah. Because they were kids. You know, like today, I'm doing a, a, some research about one of the veterans I've met. And uh, 
uh, it's kind of interesting that we're talking about that because this gentleman, this veteran, uh, was in the f a replacement. It was yeah. uh, a replacement with actually two other guys, and he, he was fortunate enough uh, to be sent to the 5 Infantry Division 11 Regiment um, in January 45. So he was lucky because actually was sent to a company with too many, no. But look at that. He gonna cross the Sore River in February 1945, okay? Yeah. Which is crazy is that he told me during the interview that he was scared of drowning mm -hmm. because he didn't know how to swim. And I'm just gonna read you something. Um, the first mission for the three young replacement was the crossing of the Sore River. Before his training, Fred did not know how to swim. He received his first swimming lesson in September of 1944. It was a big challenge to cross a river, especially when the enemy is shooting at you. After they crossed the river, German artillery started to fall all around them. The three soldiers' replacement who had trained together were all wounded in action in the same area the same day. But my point is that this veteran, Fred uh, Dorazio, was not only scared because of the bullets of the enemy, but because mm -hmm. he didn't know how to swim. And mm -hmm. that's probably something you don't think about. But at that time, some of those guys, they were not living near lakes, near li rivers. They didn't have a like, public swimming pool all mm -hmm. around the place. And those men are the ones that we're talking about that are going to take part in amphibious operation, crossing mm -hmm. operation, the Rhine River, the Sol River, the Mer Is there are so many rivers. And some of those guys didn't even know how to swim. So mm. that's something that when we're talking about fear, you know, mm. he was scared to death because of the fact that he couldn't swim. Yeah. Yeah. With people shooting at you. Yeah. On top of that. Yeah. Another long story. <laughs> <laughs> In episode uh, five, uh, Alan Green uh, shared his experience of D-Day on Homa Beach and said, um, I saw the war, I saw debris in the water, not just material debris, but human debris of people face down. It was a sight that made you grow up from a 19 year old to a man. Um, it was a very moving um, uh, part of the podcast. And, and, and Cecil Newton also talked about the psychological effects of pulling the charred remains of comrades uh, mm. out of burnt German tanks. Um, how did the veterans uh, you interviewed um, deal with the trauma, PTSD and stuff like that? Do, do they easily talk about it? No, 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 no. And that's one of the very complex and tricky subject to talk about. Yeah. Some of those guys that I've met told me straight, oh, I never had any issues when I returned home. Yeah, I married my wife, had a job, and, you know, went back to work um, just a, a, a few days after I returned home, you know. Mm -hmm. But some of them I know were struggling at one point in their life because... I won't mention his name, but one of my friend and veteran, he passed away since, but he was in love with a girl and she was in love with him. And in 1945, when he came home, uh, so they had kind of a date, you know, and it's been many years that they knew each other. And when he came home and went out for coffee or for a meal, he actually broke up with her. And mm -hmm. she was expecting him to ask her for, you know, to marry her. Yeah. And he told me I was not able to date any other girl. I was not able to express any type of feelings until 1958, 1959, until like, wow. you know, he, he, he met another girl. And, but he said during all this time, almost 15 years, he had a lot of trouble. Yeah. Uh, and I do think that it was PTSD just at the end of his life. I visited him and he agreed to say battle fatigue. But yeah. you know what it is, you know, it's clearly he's home for 15 years, he's struggling, he's PTSD. And I do think that a lot of those guys were suffering a different, uh, you know, level, uh, a form of PTSD, um, especially the one that were in combat or were, uh, you know, exposed to, uh, to violence, blood, or anything that could 
traumatize you. Mm. And some of them, you know, are actually are, are still having nightmares, but mm. they are not the one that tell me those things. Sometimes the veteran, when he's going for a bathroom break, the wife is coming and say, you know, he's still having nightmares. So I hope he won't have any tonight. And, you know, I feel bad. I feel ashamed. But I'm like, I need, we need to capture those stories so we can tell them to future generation. But some of those guys, even if they're going to, you know, look strong and tough and, you know. I remember when I was in Pennsylvania, one of my friend Brad Schutz is putting me in touch with veterans. And he's, mm-hmm. he's in touch with a veteran of the 327 Glider Infantry Regiment. I was like, okay. wow, amazing. You know, they were in Normandy. And uh, it was like, yeah, hey, I called the guy like three days ago. Uh, he told me it was fine. He was happy to meet us. And and one morning, that was just the day before we we're supposed to meet him, he actually called my buddy, Brad, and he said, Brad, it's been three days. I've, I'm having nightmares. Uh, we need to stop. Just don't try to to come and talk to me about that. Uh, I, I I need to forget about it. Mm. I feel very ashamed and bad again because it's not helping them, you know, to do that. But my point is that... Are, are you sure about that? Like, do, do you really feel that, uh, it, it, you know, talking about it uh, won't help them um, overcome oh, no. all that? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that some of them are still PTSD. Yeah. But of course, most of the guys that I've met, actually it helping them. Mm. it's helping them and as well in their family oh I'm not trying to say don't record veterans because it's not helping I'm just trying to tell you that you know we were talking about PTSD and battle fatigue and stuff Mm. so some of them are still suffering from it and I think in some case it's better to leave them alone you know Mm. but in many many cases I've been contacted by families like weeks months years after and they're like Flo you know we're so thankful since daddy opened up with you, he started to open up with his own grandchildren and, you know, and it, it, the, the, the family is, is thankful. They're trying, they're, they're reconnecting on something that was so difficult to talk about. Mm. So there's some trauma, there's some pains and some sorrow. Some of the guys managed to put the war behind and move on, but some of them, they clearly did not. And the process of recording them is helping them mm-hmm. or actually it's not helping them at all. And it's it's better to just, you know, leave them alone on mm-hmm. this type of, you know, conversation because, yeah. we. I mean, I don't know the, the smell of the war. I've never been in combat. I've never been at war. And I heard some stories that actually made me feel very sad. Uh, I was troubled you know, by mm-hmm. some of the stories, but can we really understand what's th- what those guys went through, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. An- another long answer, sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. It's great that you show all this. Um, but, 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 but as you said, I'm sorry, Clément. Yeah. But that was the point. And you agreed and we agreed, nothing is black or white. Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. And by the way, about that, um, Sam Carlyle in um, episode three uh, had very kind words about the French uh, and concluded his interview with, uh, and if you get in trouble again over there, we would be by your side. But we know that uh, at the time, during the war, uh, American soldiers and, and French civilians didn't always get along. Did you get any anecdotes about... Um, yeah, yeah. Um like you said, like nothing was all black or all white. Uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's a again, you know, I I'm, I enjoyed this interview because we we're touching some uh, different subject that I usually don't talk about. And mm-hmm. uh, yes, uh, not all the Americans uh, were happy with the French, and not all the French were happy with the Americans or mm. the Allied soldiers. And I've got some stories. I, I've met some guys who clearly told me that they didn't like the French. Mm. I felt hurt. I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, you know, but I've got some stories, you know, and I, I wouldn't understand, you know, like uh, back in January, I've met a veteran who was in the 80 Infantry Division. Mm-hmm. And at one point, he was in charge of guarding um, some supply uh, because, you know, uh, 
there were like a lot of supplies coming, food, uh, you know, uh, medical supply, other things, you know, gasoline, and they were guarding the 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 the, the supply camp. And it, it told me like, you know, we saw so many, you know, French trying to sneak in during the night, stealing stuff. Mm. And we were pissed, you know, like we are fighting this war. We're liberating you people and you're stealing our stuff so we can win the war. So I understand his point, but I told him nicely because I understand both point of view. That's the thing, you know, French yeah. being married to an American, traveling in France mm. and America, you know, mm. I was like those French, and I'm sorry for what they did. They probably live four years, you know, during the occupation. Mm. And in some area in France, you know, people were starving. They were mm. hungry, uh, struggling in their life. That's why we had so many women that started to offer services to American or, you know, allied soldiers, uh, prostitution, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we have as well, like, people who are going to steal and sell it, you know, on the black market. And mm. I'm not trying to find an excuse, but I just told to those same men that were mad at the French that we had a very difficult time for four years. We were occupied. Mm. We lost our freedom. We lost our dignity. And to be liberated was the beginning of a new stage, the stage of reconstruction. Mm. But the economy was completely, you know, gone. Uh, the, our stability, I mean, everything. Some of the cities were completely destroyed. People were starving. And that was difficult. And there's another veteran that I've met. I don't know if the story is true or not, but mm -hmm. I think it is because he didn't want to tell me the story. And that was the first time it was recorded. He landed in Marseille in the fall of 1944. Uh, he was in the armored unit. Mm -hmm. And... It started to be very moved when it started to talk about the French. Yeah. I was like, why? Well, I mean, it was like, he told me you won't like it because I was like, you know, who are the French, first French that you had interaction with? Do you remember, you know, the a cliche picture of French with the flags and be happy and stuff? And he's like, I remember we had a camp outside of Marseille and we had like a place where we would go to the bathroom, you know, yeah. to relieve themselves. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of the bush, you know, there were like girls uh, that were asking the GIs if they wanted different services, mm -hmm. you know. And it told me some of those girls were like 12, 13, 14 years old. Wow. And he started to cry and he was so moved because he was like, he told me, why did you let those kids do that? Yeah. Why did you let those kids do that? So... To this point, I can't tell you for sure if the story is true, mm -hmm. but I can tell you that the emotion and the feelings of the veterans were there. Yeah, and uh, I do think that it's it's possible that some young girls were actually, you know, prostitutes because there were no other choice. Yeah. I don't know. So that's that's you know that's he was not hating the French, but he was like, why did you let those girls do that? He felt sorry. He was a Christian. He grew up in the, you know, you can imagine in the farm. He, he he just had a simple and beautiful farming life until he was assigned to an armored unit. And mm -hmm. even being before in combat, you know, he saw some very disturbing stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the stories that he was very moved. He was crying and it was just asking me, why did you let those girls do that? You know? Yeah, but again, it was a very different time and it, it, it makes us uh, realize how lucky we are uh, yeah. today. Yeah, and but again, Clément, I'm, I'm just telling you one side, you know, mm. because I have a lot of stories of happiness. I've had a lot of stories of beautiful meetings with uh, drinks and food and love story that were consenting on both sides and... It's just because you asked me to kind of mention some stories that you probably don't hear a lot. Mm, but mm. so I'm not trying to say that everything was bad, you know, but not everything was good. That's yeah. the only thing. Of course, of course. Because I've got like more stories 
uh, you know, even the civilians that I've met, of course, there's some sad stories, you know it. But uh, mm. like, uh, I'm talking to a lot of young children that were like, you know, 40, uh, in 44, 10, 12, you know, eight years old. And a lot of them do remember, you know, the liberation as a beautiful moments of, you know, chewing gum, chocolate and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but it's another perspective because it's a perspective of children, not adults. So it's another story. Yeah, and the adults probably didn't all have good experiences with the soldiers as well. Yeah. Mm. Touchy subject, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Some pe well. some people don't want to hear about it. And uh, I understand uh, mm. sometimes when I'm doing tours, you know, I can feel like uh, if, if I need to be like, I I'm going to ruin my business telling those stories. But mm. <laughs> mm. And other guides are doing that in Normandy. Are you here to learn about what really happened or are you here to be comforted in mm. the ideas of you had about the liberation. Yeah. Because we're talking about the war. Yeah, it's a terrible thing and uh, we should always People are that, dying, yeah. people are struggling, mm. people are, you know, it's pain and sorrow, of course there's joy. There are a lot of beautiful moments. It's the liberation. But the the view that we have today of the liberation is more about the D-Day anniversary that we have and it's beautiful. Yeah, it's romantic and um, but this yeah. is not what war is and uh, this is why it's important your work and you know the simple fact of recording veterans so that we have an idea of course we cannot understand completely what they went through but uh, we have an idea of uh, the horror uh, that yeah exactly and because the fact that war is terrible and it should never happen again yeah we, we have to be positive you know stay optimistic but uh When you talk with those guys, you realize that, you know, there's some beautiful meetings, there are beautiful moments, you know, but there are a lot of, yeah, as you said, like a horrible mm -hmm. time, violence, mm -hmm. blood. And that's what the war is about. You know, it's not just um, a romance. You know, yeah. I love I love the movie Pearl Harbor, by the way. Mm -hmm. But when you watch this movie, you kind of want to join the Air Corps and fight and find a beautiful lady that's going to fall in love with you and, you know. It's tricky. That's why, like, one of the, the movie that I, I really love the most is The Thin Red Line. Mm -hmm. uh, it's because I don't feel that there's too much romance in it, even if the music is sometimes a little bit bringing your feeling in one direction. Mm -hmm. um, the, you, you can feel the pain of those guys. Uh, you can feel, like, the brutality of the war. Yeah, it's always the, about the contrast between uh, the, the the horror of war and the beauty of nature and... Mm -hmm. It yeah. makes you appreciate everything you have. Definitely. Yeah. But again, you know, with the stories I told, you know, I'm not trying to uh, just talk about the bad stuff, of mm. course, but it's what I think that people hear less about. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, I've met so many civilians and so many French and so many American, British veterans that were like uh, a lot of beautiful memories about not the war, but about... Uh, the French, the countries they liberated, uh, the Belgium, people from Netherlands. But of course, through all those beautiful stories, there are always some bad ones. Anyway. Courtesy of Florent Plana, this is Thomas Clarke of the 26th Division, wounded in Germany and coming home for the first time after the war. Yeah, I was at Camp Mead, so I took the bus from Camp Mead into Baltimore, got on a streetcar, Riding up Greenmount Avenue, saw a buddy of mine, Tom Smoot. Hi, Tom, how you doing? Yo, oh, what are you doing? I said, I'm just getting home from the army. Oh, okay. I got off the streetcar, walked up half a block to my mother's house. <laughs> I rapped on the door and I said, I'm home. I never called her or anything. That's the, way I, that's the way I left, and that's the way I came home. Well, I think we've covered a lot of stuff in a bit more than an hour, but um, to conclude, yeah. I, I want to talk about our uh, generation because we, we're both uh, about the same age. Um, Alan Green um, said that uh, going through the Depression and World War II helped him and his fellow soldiers learn about um, how to take care of themselves and, and uh, made them want to Better life for their children. Um, to quote a famous line in uh, Saving Private Ryan, my, my person favorite, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. do, do you believe that we earned uh, what we have today and, and how do we compare to uh, the greatest generation? 
So it's a very interesting question, Clément. And I, I do think that uh, these guys that we're talking about were in their 90s and the, the young guys today from 2020 are living in two different worlds. Like uh, the, the world from 1930 and the world from 2020 is very different for a lot of different aspects. And um, they grew up during a depression. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of them were working hard and you had to work hard or you were just, you had no other options or you would starve. You would not put food on your table. Uh, they were fighting for basic stuffs, you know, for, you know, keeping a house, having some food and just keeping your job. Uh, not all families, of course, but I think that a lot of, you know, generation uh, in America uh, suffered because of the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. uh, 2020, I, I know that Macron said something about that, that the generation that is going through 2020, the young generation uh, is uh, going to suffer, you know, and going to struggle uh, because of COVID and stuff. And I agree, you know, mm -hmm. but comparing to what those guys went through, I think that uh, it's not comparable. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm part of this generation. We grew up with comfort. We grew up with electricity, water, TV, mm. did you ever like wondering, am I going to eat tonight? Mm. I think the generation that went through the big depression was an amazing generation, but I would not say the greatest because it would mean that we have no hope mm -hmm. that we're going to be like, uh, we, we won't be able to be as good as they, they were. I'm, and I think that if something would happen again, a big depression, mm -hmm. And with the coronavirus, you know, we're starting to struggle. You know, a lot mm -hmm. of people now are starting to lose their job. Some shops going to have to close. No tourism, border has closed mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But I do think that our generation could adapt mm -hmm. and soon be more uh, a part of a community, you know, uh, helping each other and be less focused on the individual. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm clear, but yeah. yeah. So my, I know my answer is super long. I'm sorry, but no, I'm no. I'm just trying to say that uh, I, I'm wondering, and I don't think that our generation is uh, is bad and could not do the job, you know. But the thing is that we have so much comfort that we don't even realize how lucky we are. Yeah. But maybe in a time of depression, economic crisis, where people are gonna really start to struggle more and more. Maybe we could do the job. We could be as great as they were. That's what I hope. Well, thank you very much for your time, Flo, and uh, congratulations again on your uh, amazing work. Um, now, now, just what's next for you? Do you uh -huh. have there a lot, other yeah, a lot of projects. So, uh, for a few projects, I'm gonna have to uh, tell you that when my mic gonna be off. <laughs> but uh, uh, for two, yeah, actually, I can't tell you much but we're gonna still still like uh do some project like we did this year with the conseil départemental de la manche mm -hmm. we produced like 15 videos sharing the stories of world war ii veterans and we had 1.3 million views on wow. facebook uh so that was great and i hope to have more project like that uh in the future uh to share more stories uh to have more like uh coverage you know and just to be able to just like touch more people you know with those stories. Yeah, sure. Well, keep up the good work. Yeah, thank you, Clément. And, and uh, see you in Normandy soon. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Bye, Bye, Flo. To conclude this podcast and courtesy of Florent Plana, this is PFC Moss of the 603rd Grave Registration Company about his gruesome work of uh, picking up the dead bodies of GIs after the battles. And this is a very moving testimony. So, uh, we got there, and uh, our group was uh, didn't get offloaded for three or four days after the invasion started. And then we was out, mostly out in the field picking them up, you know, where the airborne landed everywhere and all scattered. And we were picking them up. And there was hundreds of them to be buried. Civilians helped them start digging the graves and whatnot until they got the German prisoners. 
in German, afterward German prisoner dug them all. And we combed the fields, and they, they brought them in to the collecting points, and then we transported them to the cemetery. I can recall at one time that 109 on a truck transported to the cemetery. That's a pretty good load. We had one, one guy in our unit picked up his brother at the hospital. That was a pretty, pretty tough. And I'll tell you another thing too, just like when they discharged us, they didn't offer us no counseling, no nothing. You just on your own. And today, what would you do today if you went through that? It's been a fascinating conversation with my friend Florent Plana. You can find more about his work on his website World War II Veterans Memories, www.veteransmemories.org and book a tour of Normandy with him next time you come to France. You can follow him on Facebook, Instagram and watch some of his interviews on YouTube. Actually, how about you follow Till Victory as well? I'm also on Facebook. And check out the other episodes on Spotify, Deezer, iTunes, any platform you usually listen to your podcasts on. Oh, and get the book also. <laughs> Next month, and I know you've been waiting for it for a long time, I'll release the part two of my conversation with 101st Airborne Paratrooper Tom Rice. In part one, we covered his training and D-Day. Now in episode eight, he'll talk about Market Garden, being wounded in Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge and about the end of the war. So stay tuned and subscribe to the podcast because you don't want to miss the next episodes. Till next time, au revoir à tous.